Do me a favor, would you? Start dreaming bigger than you're dreaming. Start thinking bigger than you're thinking. Because God, well, here's a scripture for you. With God, all things are possible. All things are possible. But I want to suggest to you that all things are not possible. They're probable. It's probable that God's going to touch your life. It's probable that God's going to change things. It's probable that God's going to shift things in your mind, in your family, in your finances, and your health. So start dreaming bigger because, see, we get in this... We, Ah, oh. The church get not this church, but the church gets into a status quo mentality and does not want to think any bigger. Right. Gets put in a box in the Holy Ghost and says, "Well, this is all there is. This is all I've seen. This is where I'm going." And God's telling me to tell you, start dreaming bigger because you haven't even seen close to what God wants to do. What your need is, is not only possible, it's probable. You know why? Because where two or more gathered, well, let's see, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, ah, and you, there's four. So things in your life are not only possible, they're probable. But listen, think about that. I'm just trying to follow right here right now. So think about that thing that you need God to do, that miracle. Do I dare say a miracle? Do I dare use that word in church? Well, the modern day church is taking that word out of their service. They've said, well, you know, we hope God shows up. Let me tell you, if God doesn't show up, what do you got? God's available in heaven, and he wants to show up on earth. And guess where he wants to show up? He wants to show up through you. And he wants to do miraculous things in your life and through your life. But we've got to start thinking different, church. We've got to start thinking bigger. We've got to start thinking out of the box. We've got to start having faith for miracles and prosperity and healing and things to happen, not only through our life, but through somebody else or into somebody else's life. Because all with God, all things are probable. They're probable. And I'm pretty sure they're probably going to show up in mine. And I'm pretty sure they're probably going to show up in yours too. Because God wants to do great things through your life. Amen. Here, let me just say this while I'm on the, in this little thing here. Here's the problem with the modern day church. Can I just say it? The modern day church back in the 80s, back in the 90s came into this in, entertainment model. They went from being, well, you know, old, you know, the, the, the traditional model of church wasn't good enough anymore because we weren't attracting enough people to church. And so we switched the model and we went into looking like the world because we figured if we can look like the world, the people in the world go on being the church. So we switched from a traditional model of what God had originally said into an entertainment model that the world was showing us, and we figured, well, we like it, so must be they like it. But let me tell you something. Some entert- here's, what, here's what the entertainment um, model of the church did. It taught everybody to walk into church, to sit down to be a partaker, and to get to hear what they wanted, not what they needed. And when we started hearing what we wanted instead of what we needed, we took every bit of power out of the God's word, but we liked it that way because now I'm not getting challenged and convicted and I'm not growing. I don't have to look. I can just look like everybody. But now we've got a whole bunch of people in the church, and I, you know, this is just me. I feel like God is trying to move the church, not this church, but the whole church, 
right? I feel like God's trying to move the whole church out of the entertainment model that we drew into in the 80s and 90s and bring us right back into the Holy Ghost model where miracles happen and and limbs grow back and creative things happen and blind eyes see and deaf ears. But listen, some of the people in church couldn't find the Holy Ghost if he threw them off a roof. And we've got to get back to the place where we can hear God and feel God and know God and understand God's presence and know what he's trying to do and feel his direction in our life. And so we're going to have to unwind our thinking of all church is for is I come in and I sit down and I get entertained. It's, but I just kind of like go into, you know, I go into my nothing box when I get to church. You know your nothing box? Guys know nothing box. (laughs) Alan knows nothing box. He's got a nothing box. Guys have this thing, ladies, called their nothing box. And me personally, I can be driving down the road just driving. And you see everything that's happening, and you hear everything that's going on around you, but you're in this nothing box. And my wife says, what are you thinking about? I go, nothing. She goes, how can you be thinking about nothing? I said, because that's just where I'm at right now. But we as churchy folk come walking into the doors of the church, and somehow by osmosis, our nothing box transfers to all the women in the church too, and now they go into their nothing box. There's two, three, four, five thousand people in church. Everybody's in their nothing box. (laughs) Lord help. Am I right? And everybody in the church has a need, and we can't find God, and we don't know when he's going to show up, and what's he going to do in this situation? I got news for you. Let's start dreaming bigger. Let's start believing God for more, because uh, he wants to do something miraculous in your life. And he probably... You know, he wants to do it through you in your own life just as bad as you want him to do it through somebody else in your own life. So I just had to go there. Let's unwind our um, mindset of, because now, now traditional churches, I walk in, there's lights, there's cameras, there's action, and it's how great can the worship leader lead worship? And I'm going to judge the church on what I see rather than the church's ability to get me into the holy of holies where I really need to be. Because the entertainment model has drugged me out so far. I wouldn't be able to find God if he threw me off a roof. And I need to be able to get back into God's presence. Listen, it ain't all about lights action camera it's about does god show up it's about what does he want to do in your life and my life and what does he want to do through you so let's as a corporate body start to unwind things in our mind and really start to believe that god wants to do something miraculous in and through so that we can be a change in the world. Because I'm pretty, nah, you know. Well, you can't prove that. I'm pretty sure that God's trying to get the church. Listen, he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And man, I got more spots and more wrinkles. So if I don't start doing something about my own spots and my own wrinkles, the worship leader ain't going to have a chance. The worship leader is not going to have a chance at my spots and wrinkles. And remember... Revelation 19, 7, the bride has made herself ready. So if I don't start making myself ready, well, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to start thinking different, number one. I'm going to start seeing different, number two. I'm going to start believing different, number three. I'm going to get out of my status quo mundane, every day is the same day box, and I'm going to get into God's life and God's world and God's word and God's vision and God's peace and God's hope and God's life and God's healing and God's prosperity for my life instead of being where I am, locked down in my own little personal number nothing box, driving down the road of my life, getting nowhere fast. 
Where that junk was I going to go from here? Oh, I know. I know exactly where to go. Would you uh, put on the screen? Hang on, I had to get all this. Well, I saw this, you know, so I had to. Can you give me um, Matthew 4, verse 17? Phil, would you come here for a minute? You're taller than me. Would you take this and would you tape it right over that word right there? Just that one word? Just that one word. Let me ask you this. So let me ask you, while he's doing my dirty work because I'm, I'm vertically challenged. <laughs> let me ask you this. What does a... What does a mature Christian look like? What does he look like? What does she look like? <laughs> Let's talk about that a little bit. Because uh, that's Jesus talking right there. See it from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, but we're living in a cancel culture. And so church even has bought into some cancel culture. And the church doesn't remember our entertainment, our entertainment model that we're in. And we just want to take out some words that are troubling. Troubling to them, but really troubling to me. Because if I can get those words out of my life, they don't challenge me. They don't bother my mind. They don't give me butterflies when I hear them. But here's what else they don't do. They don't change me one bit. In God, it's his business to change the church. Remember Revelation 19.7? It's his business. He does it real well. He knows exactly how to do it. Well, I mean, you're his created thing, right? He created you, and therefore he knows exactly how to fix you. But if we don't get it out of our box, and we always take what we want instead of what we need, we never grow, we never flourish, we never get healed, we never get set free, and we're living in this cancel culture, so I'm just going along with it. Can you go with me? So watch, watch, watch. So, so Jesus then becomes our model, right? I mean, he's what a mature Christian looks like, right? So verse 17 says, from that time, whatever time that was, when Jesus showed up and started talking like he talked, he began to preach, watch this. He began to preach, notice that word, and say, now why are those two words in that line of text right there? Why? Why is it worded that Jesus began to preach and to say? Because Jesus wasn't double-minded. What he said, he lived. And it wasn't the other way around. He didn't just go out and talk a good talk. He didn't just go out preached the word, he lived it. It was him all the way to the bone. And so he had things that other people at that time didn't have because they wouldn't do what it took to get them. So here's the question God's asking you right now. What are you neglecting in your spiritual life that will get you to the place you've always said you wanted to go? Because, you know, I mean, I come in church, I look real good because I look good, and I talk a real good churchy talk because I know how to do it. I've been in church 30 years, and, you know, I know the lingo, and I know where to sit, and I know how to look, and I know the body language to assume to make you think that I got it all together. 
And inside, I'm full of dead men's bones. And you're trusting me to get you in. The average pastor proven, the average pastor prays five minutes a day. Five minutes. So I'm, let me tell you something. The average pastor is not saying and preaching the same thing. They're preaching one thing and they're doing another. They're living one whole life, but they're looking really good in front of you, and you're, uh, you, you are relying on them to get you ultimately into heaven, and they don't even know how to get there. And so the church is coming, I think, is coming, and you watch and see if this doesn't bear itself out in the future. The church that has traditionally been entertainment and lights and camera and action Listen, lights in action doesn't necessarily mean Holy Ghost. In action doesn't necessarily mean accomplishment. And if it's not accomplishing your goal to get into heaven, then where are we going? And so we need to come. I need to come out of my entertainment. Great looking. Awesome handsome and I need to get into the place where God sees my heart Mm -hmm. the same way he sees my outside so Jesus began to preach and to say dude the kingdom of heaven is at hand you know what he was saying the kingdom of heaven is right here It's right here. But we conveniently leave that one word out. Because it's bothersome. It's troubling. It's tacky. It's sticky. It bothers me. It gets me all butterflies when I think about it. Because we want to take that word that we have canceled on Sunday morning. And we want to get into the kingdom of heaven there and we want to get into the kingdom of heaven here but that troubling word we don't want to deal with that thing because that's troubling but guess what bro at bro bro at without putting all the ingredients in the soup it might not taste like you think it's going to on the other side So from that time, now Jesus was a great leader, wasn't he? Jesus was, I mean, he's the rock of your salvation. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's, he is a um, mature Christian, right? He began to preach. But he lived the same thing, and he lived a life of repentance because that's who he was. My question is, do we? Do we? Because we like it. Well, 25 years ago, 35, 45, 55 years ago, you stinking dinosaur, you repented of the old life and came into a whole new kingdom, right? And we'd like it if it just stayed that way. And so we'd like to cancel that word because it's troubling, because I've got stuff hiding in there that I'd rather not deal with. But we're not going to get to the place God wants us to be personally as a kingdom, as a church, without dealing with some of the stuff that is hiding in the rafters, right, right, right. without dealing with some stuff that was put there 25 years ago, without dealing with the issues and the problems and the <laughs> things that I'd just rather not deal with because you know, it's troubling. Well, guess what? You want God to show up in your life. We ultimately want to end up in heaven, right? Right? So what are you saying? You saying if I don't continually repent of things, I'm not going to heaven? No, that's not what I said. 
But there are people who are just going to barely get there. I mean, you got your fire insurance if you've repented, yes. But wouldn't you like to live a life that this guy modeled? And he didn't just preach it, he lived it. He lived a life of repentance. So if I try to live a life without repentance, guess what I'm getting? Not much. I'm dealing with everything I'm dealing with. I'm worried about everything I'm worried about. I'm trying to undo everything that, listen, and I know I've made mistakes too. And I deal with the outcome of those mistakes even to this day. But God's will is that he takes the sting away from them and brings me into a whole new life. But I can't look one way in church and act another way at home all week. That model's gone. So I need to begin to do this. Now, don't get all legalistic and churchy and weird with me. Okay, don't do it. If it was Jesus' lifestyle, it ought to be mine. Not because I have to. I get to. It's not a I have to thing or a I should thing. It's a I get to thing. And if I do, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to start to look more and more and more and more and more like that guy right there. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's the guy that walked on water. I'm pretty sure he's the guy that raised the dead. I'm pretty sure he's the guy who stood on the bow of the boat and spoke the wind. It was a great calm, and the waves just went like this. What waves you got in your life that you need taken care of? Because he's able to do it. He's able to do it. But we are the ones who have to start thinking different. We are the ones who have to start trusting God to get us to the place. So here's my challenge to you. Start to dream bigger. Because I'm pretty sure there's a scripture that says he can do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything I can ask or even think. So if I can think it and ask it, it's not big enough for him. So start dreaming bigger. Start dreaming farther. Start dreaming more magnificent. There's a good word for you. Because God's magnificent. And if he shows up on a Sunday morning, then all things, every single one of them, is not only possible, it's most likely probable that you're going to get set free, healed, delivered. Things are going to start to fall off. Things are going to start to change in your life. Your mindset's going to start to change. Your world's going to start to change. Your family's going to start to change. Your marriage is going to start to change. Your personal life's going to start to change. Your But we can't have a cancel culture that's afraid of words like repent and the blood, and consecration. We have to embrace those things because those, let me just tell you something. The devil is scared to death of you. But we can't drop all the tacky words and expect him to stay scared of me. Because when I start dropping those troubling words, guess what happens? My power drops off too. And if I don't have the power, uh, eh, me, right? So we begin to preach and say, repent. All that repent, look it up, look it up. Here's what it means. Change the way you think. That's all it means. Change the way you think. And why do you say that? Because when I change the way I think, it's going to change the way I speak. If I change the way I speak, it's going to change the way I live. If I change the way I live, I'm going to become dangerous. 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 
Here, let me just, I just, you know. And here's another, here's another tacky word. Ready? Prayer. Prayer's a tacky word. It troubles me because that means I got to spend time doing something I don't really understand. Looking for something that I'm pretty sure I need, but I don't quite know how to get. I could show you a picture. Tom Gabriel took it Wednesday night. You think, you think, you think God don't show up here on Wednesday nights? I can show you a picture. There's a scripture that says the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. Let me tell you something. He was standing right back there where Nick is walking in the door, and he took a picture up here. There's a visible haze up here. It was a fog. It's like, it's like when you're driving down the road in the fog, that's what it looks like. Yes. Yes. And I can't show it to you. I don't think somebody sent it to me. I, can you show can you? I don't know. I'm not that techie guy. You, you're asking the wrong guy for all that stuff. You are asking the wrong guy. Oh. It's hard to see. Look at the glare off those lights. There's a fog right there. Well, guess what? That fog is going to get thicker and thicker and denser and denser. And pretty soon, there's going to be people bringing people that who are sick yeah. in the doors. And as soon as they hit that fog, guess what's yeah. going to happen? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They had a picture to compare it to where it was oh, yeah. Like that. There's another picture that he took, you know, and, and everything in your mind right now wants to say, oh, yeah, you know, that's just the lens filter he used or this or that. He took this, another picture with the same camera right there. And it was crystal clear. So there's two different pictures of pretty much the same thing, different times. And one is full of fog, isn't. Mm -hmm. That's the presence of God, y'all. That's us getting out of an entertainment model and getting back to what God wants in the first place. The Holy Ghost living in men and doing things through them on the planet that is remarkable and believable and stinking magnificent. That's where it's going. Oh, I asked you what you thought a spiritually mature mature Christian looked like. Because I've seen a lot of them. I can put a tie on with the best of them. Right? That makes me spiritual mature. Right? Here, let me show you what Jesus' definition of a spiritually mature Christian looks like. Okay, and listen. It, my son-in-law wears a tie. If you want to wear a tie, wear a tie. If you want to wear jeans, wear jeans. If you want to wear cutoffs, wear cutoffs. But put a smile on your face and enter into the presence of God so he can begin to do things in you and through you and remove things that you don't want in there. And he can put things in there that he can use through you in somebody else's life. It's not about what I look like on the outside. It's what he sees on the inside. It's all about what he sees on the inside. So here, I'm going to show you what a spiritually mature Christian in Jesus. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, eh, design's not it. Um, his, his idea of a spiritual mature Christian. Ready? Can you give me um, Matthew 5, start verse 1. Seeing the multitudes, that's what you see, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated... His disciples came to him. It was important that they got in the presence of Jesus because what he had began to rub off on them and how he acted began to rub off on them. Okay, haven't got to the spiritual or haven't got to the, uh, the, the spot yet. But it's important I'm... 
if you, if there are areas in your life that you cannot um, kick, let's say, right? There are areas in your life that you can't kick, then I'm inviting you into a loving relationship and a loving encounter with Jesus on a Wednesday night. Because that right there will begin to push those things there right out of your life. That's what they did. That's what they did. They came to him. Okay, go with them. Go again. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. So now they're not only in his presence, they're getting impartation, saying... Look at verse 3. There's what a spiritual mature Christian looks like right there. And you've seen that your whole life. Read it your whole life. Heard it preached your whole life. And never wanted to be it. Because you don't like that word right there. Blessed, spiritually mature. Okay, we take that word blessed out because that I know that's a tacky word. Spiritually tacky, Christianese word. Take that out and put um, spiritually mature. Okay, that sounds better. Spiritually mature are the poor in spirit. That word right there means bankrupt go there or poverty right so spiritual poverty in you is what Jesus calculation of spiritually mature looks like well if that's the case then I don't have such a problem with the word repent because that's going to get me there. And when I sit down and God brings something to me and he says, hey, mm, 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 is that thing going to send me to hell? No. But it's going to keep me out of his presence. And if that thing right there stays there and then this gets added on and then that gets added on and then that gets added on, I'm pretty sure there's a scripture that says a little leaven Mm -hmm. I want to be spiritually mature. I don't care if I look the part or not. I want to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. Yeah. I want to pray for stinking dead people and watch them yeah. get up out of the casket. I want them to walk around and do things because that's what Jesus did. And he says, if I'm spiritually mature, then I'm going to be spiritually bankrupt. Well, I don't like the sound of that. All that means is I put him ahead of me. I must increase or uh, must decrease. You ever heard that? John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he can increase. That's all that is. And if I go through life with a mindset and a heart set and a life set of decreasing so that he can increase, guess what's going to happen? All the miracles and the, and, the, and the gifts and the blessings and the life and the peace and the joy and the hope is going to start to... But all I've been taught is to stand in the front row, look really good, look really good. I can look really good, but if my heart's not right, and I want to get in, I, I, listen, I don't only want to show up, I don't only want to show up into heaven, man, I want to create havoc for the devil on this planet while I'm here. Listen, he created havoc in my life long enough. I mean, even after I stopped living for him, he's been creating havoc in my life for years. Yeah. 
And now it's my turn to create havoc in his. And guess what? Now, listen, I can't, I, I probably shouldn't even go here. This was, you know, and it depends who hears my next words as to how wacko they think I am. But my wife and I went through a stinking dumpster fire back in the day. And because of the dumpster fire, we live, listen, dumpster fires are never going to leave you. But you don't have to live of them. And down the road, the devil is still trying to mess with us in the dumpster fire vernacular. And so I was sitting around praying the other, you know, month ago-ish. And, and remember, this is just me. This is just my opinion, okay? This is not the, you know, this is just me. This is the way I think. It's the way I think. The stinking devil has created havoc in my life. And because of that event, there was a spirit that was assigned to our life. And suddenly I saw him. And if he's, listen, and if he's assigned to my life, then he can't go anywhere. He's tethered to me. Now that used to be a problem. Till I figured out that I can create as much havoc in his life as he creates in mine. And oh boy, have I been creating havoc in his life. Oh, I've been creating havoc. That old boy is getting, whoo. If he could get away, he'd have been gone long ago. So now, just me, okay? Just me. So now, years down the road, I got up this morning, I spoke to that thing, and it left. Know why? Because it's a sign to me, and it has to stay. And that used to be a problem. But now I'm going... <laughs> and I listen, I can't prove that in my scripture. I can't. But I know what I know, and I know where I've been, and I know the experiences I've had. And every day I speak to that thing, I feel it leave. So what spirits have been assigned to your life? Here, let me have a let me get a cold one here. What spirits have been assigned to your life that have been beating a snot out of you for years and years and years and years? Because think about it. If they, if the same one has been doing the same thing all that time, start looking at it a little bit different and go, maybe that thing is... And I use the word assign because I don't know what other word to use. It's as good as any. If that thing is assigned to my life, that thing is assigned to your life, instead of it creating havoc in your life, <laughs> I am going to tear you a new one, bro. And you are going to leave bleeding and bruised. Because I can. Because I have the power. You don't. Because I have the authority in heaven. Act. I'm backed by the guy who created you. And if that's the case, I will mess with you as bad as you messed with me my whole entire life. You better get the junk out of Dodge. And, and again, don't get all weird with me. Well, he said, that, listen, this is ju I. I just know what I've been living, okay? I can't prove it in Scripture. It's not, but I know what I've been living. You ever wonder why that deal with the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over? You never deal with new stuff. You deal with the same thing over and over and over and over and over. It's coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back. Prove me wrong. I mean, maybe I'm not right. Prove me wrong. But you all, you, look at your life. You personally deal with the same stinking stuff over and over and over and over and over. So maybe 
you ought to start harassing that thing as bad as this has been harassing you. Well, I can't talk to the devil. I'm not supposed to talk to the devil. All right. Let me tell you something. I'm not talking to him. I'm showing him the boot. So don't get weird with me. But you know you got friends who've been Christians for years who deal the same thing all the time. You got people you know. I know pastors who are dealing with the same thing over and over and over and over and over. I know them. Dude, when we start thinking different, and when we start acting different, and when we start speaking different, our life's going to change. Things are going to start to happen like you can't believe. Think bigger. Dream bigger. Go miraculous. Why not go miraculous? I mean, why not? Believe for everything God's got. God is not limited. He, hey, listen, he's not running out of anointing anytime soon. And if he gives her anointing and her anointing and her anointing and her, he's, he ain't, his anointing doesn't decrease. He's got just as much as he had before. I may as well use what he gave to me to get to the place he's called me to be as healthy and blessed and full of life and hope and vision and peace, but I need to get to the place where I know that I know that I know that I know that I cannot do it without him. And if I need to get into the place of repentance for something that has been there a thousand years, bro, do it. Just get it done. Because God wants to do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything you can ask or even think, but he needs a little help from his friends. Can we stand? So with every head bowed, uh, yeah, every head bowed and every eye closed. Nobody looking around because you can feel the Holy Ghost right now. You've been feeling him all day and you're still feeling him. And that should be a sign unto you that he wants to change something in your life. I read scripture like that once. It just came back to me, so I said it. And this should be a sign unto you. You can find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Sometimes it don't look like you think it should look. Sometimes he wants to do things in your life different than you've done. Sometimes you get out of our box a little bit and let him do what he wants to do because we will get the blessing on the other side the miraculous, the power, the anointing flows through us like a river. There's a scripture that says, whatever the river touches lives. Well, conversely, everything that touches the river lives. Bro, it's life either way. So listen, if you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior... If you spent all this time looking for something you haven't found yet, I have news for you. It's that bloody Nazarene that hung on that cross for you. It's the guy who died in your place because he paid a debt you couldn't pay. You can't even come close to paying that debt, but he paid it for you. And he guaranteed you a spot in heaven. So if you've never received him as your personal Lord and Savior and you want to, with every head bowed and every eye closed, shoot your hand up, put it way up, put it right back down. So here's my next parking spot. If you have received him, uh, mm -hmm. but man, there was just a storm in my life and the roads and this spiritual realm got slippery and it went sliding right off the road and landed in the ditch man I my name's in the book but I don't know I don't know how to get a hold of the tow truck driver to drag my car back up out of that ditch I feel like I've been in a long time 
same guy, same phone call, same number. But if you feel, with every head bowed and every eye closed, that you feel like, man, your name's in the book, but boy, I just wish I could feel God more. I wish I could do things that his plan in my life is. I wish I could, I wish I was just farther along by now. If that's you, slip your hand up, put it way up, put it right back down. I see that, I see that, I see that. Listen, I'm going to pray a prayer over you, and I'm going to break old mindsets and old heart sets. I'm going to break old soul ties off you, and you're going to help me do it. And then I want to pray a prayer. I want you to pray it with me, and guess what? It's a new day in your life. Is that okay? So right now, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over old mindsets. I take authority over old heart sets. I take authority over everything that was designed to drag these people down the road of stress and worry and fear and anger and doubt and unbelief and frustration. I break an orphan spirit. How about that? I break an orphan spirit off their life right now in Jesus' name. You know an orphan when you're you feel like your father's left you you feel like your mother's left you it causes frustration and worry and doubt and fear and stress so we break that spirit off them right now in the name of Jesus and we pray a hedge about them right now and we fill it with the Holy Ghost do we fill it with the Holy Ghost Saints we fill it with the Holy Ghost. We fill that thing to the top, overflowing with the power and the presence and the glory of God right now. Because that is your lot. That is God's plan. That you live an awesome life. Not one that's all beat up, knocked down, dragged around, stomped on. God plan is that you live above only and not beneath. So Lord, we thank you that you have built this hedge, you have built this wall, and you have filled it to overflowing with your Holy Ghost, which pushes everything that was inside that wall out right now. We thank you for your presence in their life. We thank you for the thought process that pushes every thought that is not the obedience of Christ, the junk out of there. And we impart power right now. Your Zoe life coming right into them, right into their mind, right into their heart, right into that place that raises up a standard against everything the devil has wanted to do in them because of the plan you have for them. Stay with me. Say, Dear Jesus, we renounce what the devil has tried to do in our life we receive your zoe life in exchange i push out everything that is not of you and i receive everything that is god good devil bad thank you for your life in Jesus' name. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Let's worship our way out of here, Al. Oh, hang on. Hang on. Well, you know, you get to that spot, you just, everything in your brain just goes, woo. If you need prayer for anything, if there's stuff going on in your mind, stuff going on in your body, stuff going on in your life, and you need prayer, do not hesitate.
that river that's flowing right here creates life, hope, peace, joy, brings you into your destiny. God knows how to get you to your destiny. In case you didn't know, God knows. Sometimes we have to stop fighting God and start allowing His presence and His power. Listen, putting a rowboat in a river, hopping in that rowboat, throwing the oars right overboard. And I'm going with His current no matter where it takes me because it's His plan. I'm done fighting with my plan and I'm all about His plan. That's, that's where we got to get to. The Holy Ghost wants to meet you right here. His goal is to set you free, to deliver you, to take you into a whole new place. Mentally, emotionally, physically, and in your whole entire life. There, now let's worship.